this has taken a lot of time, a lot of effort to put together, and he's got a wealth of information to share. It's a real honor again to present Dr. Vazipojian. Thank you, Rich. Hi. It's nice to renew friendships I made last year. Uh, I want to thank a number of people for their help in this meeting. Uh, I want to first thank Dr. Wayne King for sending me a video cassette of the talk that I gave in San Diego last September. This allowed me to sit down about a week ago. He sent it, I received about a week ago. It allowed me to sit down and uh, review what I said and I'll try to minimize what I said before, but of course there'll be some review and I appreciate his sending it very much. I also want to thank the Academy for scheduling its meeting in Tucson this time so we could do what we now call the Tucson Dental Study. I want to, I have many thanks. To get, I could go on thanking for the whole meeting, you see. Uh, I also want to thank the subjects of our study. They've been extremely cooperative and my wife, who is one of the people who measure the urine, keeps saying, they're so prompt, they're so prompt. It's not like our Mexican study, they're so prompt. We thank you for your promptness. I also wish to thank Dr. Michael Ziff for his cooperativeness, his organizational ability. If my name wasn't Bass of Potion and I ever ran for politics, I would try to steal him away from you. Uh, if he worked for me, I'd give him a raise. Uh, <laughs> if I ever need an executive director of any side that I know, I'll try to steal him away from you. Really, very, very good. We wouldn't have even tried to do this study without him. I don't know whether this turns on automatically or could someone turn on the left hand? That's one. Thank you very much. Give me a it's on the side. We're going to stop. That's right. There, there you are. There you are. Thank you. Uh, one. Well. I'd like to move this back. Does this work? Does this? It may be the other one. I don't know which one they have. Is there another one? I really don't want to start with history. I'd like to. All right, let's start with history then, all right? But is the next one going to work? I, I don't think this is working at all. Pardon? It works on that one. Can you switch? Uh, thank you, Wayne. There we are. Well, let me say that if you can't hear me, please let's be informal shout from the back of the room louder, all right? I want to talk to you today about chelating agents, part two, if you will. I want to discuss with you, in particular, DMSA. I said relatively little about DMSA in San Diego. I'll be saying something about DMPS, but I'll try to emphasize uh, DMSA as we get into the talk. Wonderful. History. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about these two compounds. They are unique as far as dimer captochelating agents are concerned. Yeah, there's push that, uh, that one. There we are. Thank you. The MPS. Dimer propane sulfonic acid. Developed in the so Soviet Union by Printrudkin in 1956, he published his first paper with this compound. In 1958, unithiol, or DMPS, became an official drug in the Soviet's, Soviet Physicians Armamentarium. 
Petrinkin is a non-person now. When we were in, in Soviet Union in 1984, 87, we tried to find him. He just doesn't exist anymore. Be thankful you are born in this country or in this country. In 19, uh, we could not get any UNITHIO out of the Soviet Union for a variety of reasons. And in 1978, the Heil Company in Berlin, a small company that makes antidotes and diagnostic agents, came out with Dimaval. Dimaval is registered with the uh, German FDA, so-called BGA. It is not a prescription drug in Germany. It is sold over the counter. At the present time, we, our unit at the University of Arizona, have an investigative, uh, have investigative permission from the FDA, so-called uh, IND, uh, to study this drug in humans. DMSA, meso dimer acid, known gener generically as succimer, first used against heavy metal poisoning by Liang at the Institute of Materia Medica in Shanghai in 1957. Both drugs then developed originally outside the United States. Also developed by, or used by Friedheim to chelate antimony to get more antimony into cells that, or into animals and humans infected with schistosomiasis. Wanted to get more antimony in. Now, these two compounds, DMPS and DMSA, are analogs of British antileucite. As you see, this part of the molecule, all the same, S2SH groups, but it's this point and this point and this point where, and to some extent, this point where there is a difference. They're dimer capto compounds, right? In the since 1948, British antileucite has been the drug of choice in the United States for treating a variety of metal poisonings, including arsenic, to some extent mercury, and uh, also to some extent lead. Developed, or first published, its use was first published in 1945 by Sir Rudolf Peters, who literally got the Nobel Prize for his work. Why the interest in these chelating agents? Not because of the mercury in you or because of civilian metal poisoning. The interest in these dimer capto chelating agents has always been because of the chemical warfare agent. I'm sorry, I can't seem to find the. Ah, OK. Danger? I can use, ah, uh, there it is. Yes, there, okay, I've got it now. Okay. Uh, Lewisite, chemical warfare agent, a poison gas. In the, sec in the First World War, a number of soldiers on both sides, the Axis side and the Allied side, were poisoned by mustard gas, by chlorine, and by phosgene. Lewisite has always been available as a chemical warfare agent. It has, re within the last 20 years, supposedly been used in a variety of circumstances by a variety of countries in a mixture with mustard gas. Lewisite will cause a blistering, a severe blistering of the skin, a blistering of the eye, and can eventually cause systemic arsenic poisoning. It is a way of for a general to incapacitate the troops his enemy troops on either side of him as a column goes through. Lewisite can be used, its effect will be immediately. Its effect will be immediate. Mustard gas is used to completely take out of action the people on the, on his, on the general's flanks, but the general won't be able to go into those areas with his own troops because mustard is a very uh, persistent agent. It will stay around for a long time. So the interest, ironically, in DMPS and DMSA, as far as the Russians were concerned, as far as uh, China, uh, the Chinese are concerned, and as far as our government was concerned, was because of the danger of lewisite gas. Lewisite gas, the problem is with the arsenic. Very incapacitating 
material. In about, well, around about 1979, we were called by some people in our government, it was pointed out that in a, this was during the Afghanistan war, with Af Russian Afghanistan war, and it was pointed out that the, someone had found a great deal of arsenic in one of the lakes in Afghanistan, uh, in an area where there was no reason for it to be there, and therefore it began to build up in our, with our military forces of antidotes for lilacite. We were asked whether we could come up with any good antidotes, uh, whether we'd be interested. This was because in the years 55 and 59, my wife and I, while we were at Vanderbilt, had done some work with penicillamine, which is a heavy metal antidote. <clears throat> uh, my response was, let me go to the literature. In fact, my wife went to the literature. She does most of the work in our family. Thank God for women. Uh, <laughs> and uh, she found that uh, she found the two, uh, about five literature citations about DMPS and DMSA. Most of them were in the Russian literature, uh, and this caused a uh, investigation by other people, and it was soon discovered that the uh, Soviets had a very large chemical warfare potential, and therefore our government, quite rightly, began to make money available to a number of groups in this country to search for antidotes for lilacite and other heavy metal poisonings. Supposedly, we wanted these antidotes for purely defensive reasons. Why the interest of the site? Sure, from, how do these chelating agents work? A chelating agent, by definition, is a compound that will form a ring structure with a heavy metal, a, a heterocyclic ring structure, a ring structure which has more than one uh, species of atoms. What's the mechanism of action of a chelating agent, they form a chelate or complex with a metal ion. The chelate or complex is more water soluble than the metal ion and therefore the excretion of the metal from the body is increased. In addition to this, you must realize that such metals, metal ions as mercury, cadmium, whatever one you want to think about, are not floating free in our body. They're usually tied up to a protein or some other substance. The chelating agent competes with that other substance in our body that's holding on to that heavy metal, and the chelating agent has a greater affinity for that heavy metal if it's going to be effective, and therefore then forms a complex and, and excretes it. But it's free-floating. What is free-floating? The, the chelating, no, it's not free-floating. We'll soon get to that, all right? If I don't answer your question, Please bring up during the discussion. There is a, a, a slide specifically addressed to that, okay? Uh, what are the problems with BAL? One of the major problems that we're now concerned with, as far as all chelating agents are concerned, is what we call the redistribution problem, especially redistribution to the brain. Why has this come up? The major use of chelating agents in our country at the present time is the treatment of children who have lead poisoning. I won't define lead poisoning clinically at this time for you, it's not pertinent, but we want to protect the brains of children who have a lot of lead in them. Lead is known to irreversibly cause central nervous system damage. It causes problems with the learning ability of the child it causes problems as far as behavior disorders are concerned. When we give an agent, we want to give a chelating agent, we want to get the lead out of that person, out of that child's body as soon as possible. We want to protect the brain. What happened was that a few years ago, in the case of lead, Dr. Corey Schlechter at the University of Rochester showed that when she took rats and and made them intoxicated with lead and gave them a, a chelating agent, either EDTA or DMSA, each day for five days, that at the end of five days, things were wonderful if she autopsied the rats. If she autopsied the rats at four days, everything was as, what you, would, as you would expect. The levels of lead had gone down. Same with the third day, the second day, 
But if she autopsied the rats one day after EDTA or after EDTA therapy, she found a definite increase in the brain lead. We certainly don't want to increase the level of lead in the critical organ when we give therapy. When she repeated these experiments with DMSA, she found that DMSA did not increase the blood lead. In our own laboratory, we have found that DMPS does not increase the, the, the lead. British anti lewisite has been known since 1950 that when you give animals who are intoxicated with mercury, British anti lewisite there is a redistribution of the mercury, and the brain mercury levels are increased. There's a paper that got hardly any recognition for a variety of reasons, but other people have since have confirmed it, that British anti lewisite is a drug that has problems. Even though it's still an approved drug in our country, there are many reasons that British anti lewisite uh, is not a favorite drug. One of the first reasons is that it's a liquid. It must be injected. It must be injected I am. Not only is the needle painful, but when the drug hits the tissues, it is painful. 50, over 50% 50 of the people that receive British anti-lewisite for either arsenic poisoning, mercury poisoning, or other poisonings, over 50% of the people who receive British anti-lewisite have some sort of, a, of an untoward reaction, some sort of a side effect. Doesn't mean it's life-threatening, but it really is a side effect that is not desirable. So now when we compare DMPS, DMSA, and BAL, and calcium sodium EDTA to some extent, there are a number of things that we do think about. We think of the route of administration. The DMPS can be given orally because tablets are available, of course. DMSA can be given orally. BAL cannot be given orally, it's liquid. Calcium sodium EDTA is not given orally because less than 2% of it is absorbed. It's not an effective drug when it's given orally. Intramuscularly, DMP, uh, there is a preparation. DMPS preparations are now available in liquid form in the ampules, as, as many of you know. So DMPS can be given IM and I or IV. DMSA is, is effective IM or IV, but preparations, liquid preparations of pharmaceutical liquid preparations are not available. Uh, McNeil Company does not make it. It's just an oral preparation called Chemet, and this is called Dimaval. British Anti-Lewisite, also known in this country as Dimer, uh, Dimer Capro, uh, can be, it is used IM. It's not given IV. Calcium sodium EDTA is usually given by slow IV drip. So, Right away, let's forget EDTA, but comparing DMPS, DMSA, and BAL, it's much more convenient to give an oral preparation. Most Americans prefer to take something by mouth than being injected, although I'm told most Europeans feel a drug's more effective if they have it injected, but these are just subjective thoughts. Let's talk about the toxicity. One of the crudest measures of toxicity is the so-called LD50, the lethal dose or the dose that will cause the dose that will cause death in 50% of the animals that receive that dose. In this case, we're dealing with mice. In studies done in our lab many years ago, uh, and the LD50 of DMSA is 13.73, uh, DMPS 6.53. This means that DMPS is twice as toxic as DMSA. No drug is absolutely toxic free, of course. Or another way of looking at it, DMSA is is less twice is less toxic as DMPS, depending on how you want to look at it. You can see that BAL here, the value is usually about 1 to 1.48, quite different as far as toxicity is concerned. Effectiveness. By effectiveness, we're now mean, we're using uh, the term effectiveness as far as either experimental animals or humans are concerned that are intoxicated or have been challenged with, e with any one of these metals. Uh, we're not talking about test tube experiments. We're not talking about cell culture experiments. We are talking about in vivo experiments. DMPS has been clearly shown to mobilize and increase the excretion of mercury, lead, or arsenic in 
such intoxicated people or animals. DMSA will do the same thing, mercury, lead, and arsenic. British anthelocyte, effective in all cases. That does not necessarily mean it's a desired drug, but it's effective. Calcium sodium EDTA, some people in the audience might want to argue about this. It certainly has been effective, has been used against lead. It is not considered to be useful therapeutically against arsenic poisoning, and in vivo is not considered to be a good mobilizing agent as far as mercury. It will form a chelate with mercury in certain situations, but is not considered to increase the excretion of mercury in vivo. Side effects. All drugs have side effects. Uh, there's no such, if you give enough of a drug, you get a side effect. <clears throat> the most important side effect, if we want to call it that, it's really probably a bad term in this case, is the idea of redistribution of toxic metals to the brain, as I told you about. There's absolutely no evidence from experiments that, are, that have been, been done to some extent preliminarily in our lab and now are actually being assayed in a much larger context. Uh, DMPS does not appear to redistribute, redistribute toxic metals to the brain. DMSA does not. British anthelocyte certainly does redistribute arsenic and or mercury. Calcium sodium EDA clearly redistributes lead to the brain. Now remember, when you give a chelating agent, you're trying to get a you're trying to get a heavy metal out of the body. So it is in one way or other going to draw the heavy metal out of a variety of tissues or organs. Your hope is that that chelate now is then going to go down the kidney and be excreted. That's a form of redistribution, if you will. You certainly don't want redistribution of the brain. And as I may have mentioned to some of you, the Army was not, when we were supported by the Army, was not at all interested in knowing that uh, British Anti-Lucite, its material that is, it stockpiles every year for, for protection against lucite poisoning for its troops. They were, weren't particularly interested at all that bowel caused a redistribution of, of arsenic, or lucite, if you will, to the brain. But when we told them three weeks later that we'd now found that bowel caused redistribution of arsenic to the testes, it was a great concern to them. <laughs> GI side effects, again, uh, all these drugs have si GI side effects to some extent. The ones that we usually see when we do the kind of challenge test that you've, you've seen us do today is, uh, uh, is a nausea. There are other GI side effects, but most of you won't be concerned with those, and all DMPS, DMSA, and BAL all produce nausea, or all, all the, can produce nausea. Renal toxicity. Calcium sodium EDTA is known to cause renal toxicity in some people. Again, we've never seen renal toxicity. No cases of renal toxicity that I'm aware of have been reported for uh, either DMPS or DMSA. But you still must realize that these drugs are relatively new in the Western countries, and it's going to take a long time to get all the data in. Chemet, or DMSA. So that's the trade name for it by uh, the McNeil Corporation. Uh, has a uh, package insert that lists such things as uh, adverse events that are very broadly uh, defined, digestive effects, body as a whole, metabolic, nervous. So this data is available for anyone when they buy it. And it's no sense of my spending much time on it. Again, it's by FDA regulation they're required to do this. Now, I'm not going to show you DMPS. Let me say that DMPS has just about all the same side effects that DMSA has. There are, there's nothing drastically different between these two drugs, except for one thing, the speed of, of, of action. Now let me now go into uh, some of the early studies that we did. We were asked by uh, some people to see whether there was anything to what the Europeans were doing as far as the over-counter uh, Mobiliz buying it over the counter and, and mobilizing uh, mercury. And so we, uh, with the FDA's permission and approval, uh, set up certain studies. And what we're plotting here, I'm sorry this is so small, uh, urinary mercury micrograms excreted in the urine per hour versus time. The arrow is the time at which the DMPS was given. Now this was a young man who until, just happened this way, six days before 
the experiment had never had an amalgam in his mouth. And six days before he couldn't stand the pain, and went, finally went to see a dentist. He was not born in this country. Uh, and you see there's very little compared to what I'm about to show you, but the mercury begins to come out almost immediately, the first hour, second hour, third hour, and so forth. Now, young, another young man, that was two, all right? Scale's different here. Peaks around two. So now you're peaking about 18 and you're peaking for almost four hours. So DMPS is certainly causing a very rapid increase in urinary excretion of mercury. These are all, we, we only, my labor, our laboratory deals only, well, with one exception when Dr. Katie Hurlbut, who some of you have met, uh, did the uh, pharmacokinetics. Uh, we used IV DMPS at that time. In almost all other cases, we have used only oral, all right? The reason for it, well, we'll get, we'll say more about that as we come. Could you lower, or could someone lower that for me? This is an experiment that we, again, were asked to uh, investigate. The question was, is there any difference in the excretion of mercury after the DMPS challenge test, which I'll define for you in a moment, uh, if people have amalgams in their mouth or if they don't. Now let me just briefly first define or go through with you the DMPS challenge test. In our laboratory, because we are a research laboratory, and let me make it very clear to you, even though Rich said I was a PhD, I'm not a physician. I'm a research, I'm an investigator. When we do human experiments, we always have a physician. We have two superb, three or four superb, but one, the best, one of the best ones you've met. The only, one I the only reason I don't dare say the best one is her husband has also worked with us, and I don't want to get into a, a problem there. I don't know whether Katie's here or not. Anyway, uh, but she's a superb physician. Um, so if anyone calls me about what I should do or what he should do, I usually say I'm a PhD. I, I'm not a physician, and I'm telling you what I'm telling you today as a research investigator. And it's very, uh, I feel very strongly that uh, physicians are supposed to do certain things and PhDs are supposed to do certain things. And it's not up to me to tell you what's good for you on a health basis, all right? Talk about the, the challenge test. We ask that, or we, our, our protocol is that 11 hours before giving the drug, we put people on a fast. Why? If your stomach is full with food that contains heavy metal ions, then the chelating agent is going to chelate that, and the chelating agent, along with that metal in your gut, is going to be excreted in your feces. So essentially, if we give you the drug on a full stomach, we're taking the chance that less of that drug will be absorbed, and therefore will get less of an effect. And so because in research we try to take care of all the variables that we can, we routinely ask for 11-hour fast. The, uh, this actually happens to be, we would cut it off, but in 11 hours. At zero hour, we give the drug, and then in these experiments, drug, uh, the, mercury, the urine was collected at one hour, zero to one, one to two, two to four, four to six, and six to nine. Uh, now we routinely collect the urine for six hours because we and other people have shown that the zero to six hour urine collection is quite representative and meaningful as and, and can be compared to the 24-hour urine collection. So let's get back to this experiment. Because of Murray Vimy, people are concerned with amalgams, as they should be. Uh, and so we were asked to see whether the mercury load of the body, although now we probably more truthfully should say the kidney load the, or the mercury load of the kidney of the human body. Is there any relationship between the mercury load of the kidney in humans with the amalgams that they have? And so in this experiment, we got two, we advertised the college newspaper for students with and without amalgams, uh, paid them a $75 honorarium, uh, students need the money, dentists don't, uh, and then put them through the protocol, gave them DMPS at zero time, and collected the urines. The students without amalgams 
had a mean excretion at these time points as designated by the black part of this graph. All right? The students with amalgams had a mean beginning at the bottom here, going all the way up. And so essentially, the people without amalgams had one third as much mercury in their bodies or in their kidneys as those with amalgams. And so this is a clear, and I'm going to show you some correlative uh, uh, data in a minute. Uh, that this shows there's a linear relationship between the amalgam score and the urinary mercury after the MPS administration and as a number of subjects that were used, we're now plotting micrograms of mercury from zero to two hours. We've done this from zero to eight, it's, it's the same. Essentially against amalgam score. How do we define amalgam score? Amalgam score was defined for me by my wonderful private, my, my wonderful dentist, some of whom, some of you met him. Uh, Will Alter is a private practitioner, a very bright private practitioner. And I went to him and I said, look, uh, we're gonna do these experiments. I'm not quite sure that the number of amalgams in someone's mouth is meaningful. Uh, I don't know anything about dentistry. What, sh what do you think? How, what kind of measurement do you think we should make as far as amalgams are concerned? And Will being Will said, well, let me think about it, rather than giving a, me an answer right away. Talked over with his associates and came back uh, and said, well, obviously, since you're concerned with mercury being evolved, you ought to be concerned with the surface of each amalgam. And since amalgams very often are multi-surfaced, then you ought to be concerned with the diameter of each surface of each amalgam in one's mouth. So the amalgam score is the sum of all the diameters of all the fillings in your mouth. And as you can see, we have a very nice correlation here. The correlation coefficient is uh, R.94. Uh, this is very good correlation coefficient. People very often, if it's, it's R is 60.64, they think it's great. In our lab, we don't accept that at all. Okay, so very good. There is a linear relationship between the amalgam score and the urinary mercury after DMPS administration. Now let me just go back and show you one other thing. That down here, these levels before DMPS, if you will, this uh, control level, are, they are very low levels and very difficult. Analytically, they're very difficult to measure with any confidence. So one thing about the DMPS challenge test is it gives us levels indicative of of the human body's exposure, it gives us levels that can be measured with a great deal of confidence. All right. Uh, we were asked to uh, go to Mexico to study a group of, of dentists, dental technicians, and a control group for uh, a variety of reasons, which I won't go into now. For political reasons, only five dentists showed up, all right? 10 were supposed to show up, but because the dental technicians uh, were young and were uh, people who did what their, the director of the, of the hospital said, we got 10 dental technicians. Our collaborators were from another institute and they got all their control people who were not dentists. But what, th what I wanna point out, this is the urinary mercury micrograms per six hours. This is pre, before the challenge, this is after the challenge. Pre, post, pre, post. First of all, these levels, I think this level here saw something like an 88-fold increase before and after the challenge. Now, why do these young women have such high levels of mercury? In Mexico today, because of expense, they still use the old-fashioned method of preparing amalgams. They have a piece of filter paper and this little technician goes to the shell in a s small closet uh, which has a sink in it. It's not, there's no ventilation there, just the door is open. She takes, uh, with an eyedropper, she takes mercury out of the stock bottle, puts it on the filter paper, takes some of the alloy out of another container, puts it on the filter paper, carries it that way to the examining room, gives it to the dentist who then squeezes it out through the filter paper, the excess mercury. Now, I asked the, one of these young women 
what she did if she made a mistake, and she said she threw the mercury or the amalgam down the sink. All right? Sink has a trap. And I asked her, did she wash her hands here? She said yes. I said, asked her, did she use salt, hot water or cold water? Of course, she uses hot water. And as you all know, mercury is heavy. It gets caught in the trap of a sink, and any hot water you'd have would just bring up vapors. I asked another technician what she did if she made a mistake, and she said that uh, uh, she threw it in the waste paper basket. All right. And so essentially what I'm saying is one of the most satisfying uh, parts of doing work like this is that when we talked to the director of the hospital, he wanted to know what our results were, and we pointed this out to him, and he said, being a, he was a physician, not a dentist, he said, what can we do to protect these young women? And my thought, since I knew a few dentists and Alter in particular, was I said that you ought to buy a amalgam shaker. You ought to buy the amalgam capsules and use a shaking machine if you're going to use amalgams, which they have done. Unfortunately, uh, I was at a meeting in Vancouver last July, and a Swedish person came up to me and said that he has made a study of shakers, and that when shakers are used to break, as you remember, the, you have a capsule with a uh, divider, the mercury's in one half, and the alloys in the other, you shake to break the, break the divider or the membrane, and therefore your amalgam's constitute. He said that cause, the shaking causes the amalgam, the mercury to heat up, so that when you break open, when the dentist or the dental technician breaks open that capsule, he is really exposing himself to even more mercury. Uh, so obviously, there's a problem even with the, with the capsules and the shakers. All right, let me now go on and tell you one other study that might interest you. Uh, well, but before I leave this, two things. With Dr. James Wood at the University of Washington, we cooperated, uh, we've done a collaborative effort in which we sent urines from the Mexican studies, and uh, he is an expert on porphyrins, and he measured the, the porphyrin levels in the urine, and in particular, when he measured coporphyrin levels before DMPS, we found that they correlated with the mercury coming out after DMPS. Coporphyrin levels are an indication of, re of renal damage, all right? And uh, you'd expect renal damage, I if there's a lot of mercury in the kidney, you might expect some sort of correlation between the coporphyrin before DMPS was given the coporphyrin level in the urine before DMPS was given, and the mercury coming out after DMPS. There was no good correlation if we did coporphyrin before and, co and, and, and uh, mercury before DMPS. So therefore, we maintain, it's our belief that we have evidence that urinary, unchallenged urinary mercuries are not that meaningful at these low levels. That a, 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 if you want to get an idea of, of exposure of an individual to mercury, it's much better to give him the challenge test, and these challenge tests, or the results of the challenge tests, uh, correlate with other things. In addition to these studies, uh, we took Diana Echevera down to, or Diana Echevera and her colleagues went down to uh, Monterey with us, and they did uh, neurobehavior studies before we did the chelation challenge test. And uh, we found, she found, that there's a correlation, certain, neuro, uh, certain uh, neural behavior uh, results. There are certain neural behavior deficits in the uh, dental technicians that correlated with the amount of mercury coming out in their urine after the MPS. In Mexico, there is a cosmetic, a skin lotion, that is used by a lot of people, which lightens the skin. It, it makes dark skin whiter, supposedly, anyway. This uh, is not new. Uh, Africa has used ammoniacal mercury solutions for years, <clears throat> and the World Health Organization a few years ago recommended that no one used mercury compounds to lighten their skin. They still use mercury compounds. They're not ammoniacal mercury. They are mercurous chloride, caramel, calomel, as some of you know, to put on their skin. We uh, have one woman who's 87 years of age and has used it for over 30 years. Dr. Hurlbut uh, could find nothing wrong with her. 
uh, we found uh, nothing except with some of the workers I'm going to tell you about. But we're asked to go down and study the makers, the factory workers, who make this lotion, this cosmetic. And these factory workers will take kilogram amounts of mercurous chloride and dump them into a vat. And then we'll mix this into water. Mercurous chloride is very water insoluble. You go into this place, there are, there's, there's white dust all over the place. All right? uh, and these makers, if you will, had a tremendous increase in the amount of mercury coming out in their urine after the DMPS challenge. This now shows the mean was five milligrams in six hours. One of these people put out 10 milligrams of mercury. That I've never seen as this amount of mercury come out of anyone. All right? 10 milligrams of mercury coming out in six hours. Katie did find some uh, signs and symptoms in, in two of these people. Uh, and we, uh, through a series of, it's very difficult to do international studies because of communications. It was, it was our understanding that the, the factory people, the owners, would not allow us to treat these people. But since uh, about four months ago, we've learned they want us to come back and we shall for the first time be able to use DMPS in a very controlled, long-term uh, treatment schedule. The users, you see, also had an increase, nowhere near the amount that the uh, makers had. And the controls, people who are not exposed in any way that we know of to the cream or to any occupational mercury had a very limited increase. So the challenge test will tell you a lot more about how much mercury is in your kidney than uh, a straight, uh, unchallenged mercury uh, test. This also shows that in these same people, the users, the makers, and controllers, that, or the controls, that they all had some lead in them, and the amount of lead, uh, the scales are quite different. There are no 50 or 80 or 100 fold increases here. But certainly DMPS increases lead excretion, it increases arsenic excretion, it increases copper excretion, which I haven't said anything about yet, it increases zinc excretion. During a challenge test, there's no problem. The amount of excretion, increased excretion of these, of the so-called essential metals uh, is very, very small. And uh, Chisholm has found in children that even over a longer period of time, the amount of copper coming out after DMPS is small compared to the amount of copper that comes out after calcium sodium DTA treatment. But one should certainly be aware of the fact that if anyone takes these drugs chronically, there ought to be some kind of test done to be certain that you're not depleting yourself of, uh, of essential metals. That's in the case of chronic use of these drugs. Therapeutic uses, hopefully. I don't call the challenge test a therapeutic use. By, that's just my, my definition. Therapeutic use, by therapeutic use, I mean when someone is ill and you want to give a medication to try to overcome that illness. Uh, the MPS was first used by American investigators in the Iraqi disaster. Let me tell you a few things about the Iraqi disaster. In the 60s, actually late, 60, late 50s, early 60s, there was a, a famine in Iraq. Uh, the United States, trying to be helpful, uh, sent grains, seeds, so the farmers could plant these seeds and get more grain and therefore more food. The seeds uh, at that time, and to some extent still, have a mercurial fungicide on them to protect the seeds from fungus uh, infection. And on these 100-pound cloth bags uh, is clearly stated, uh, poisonous, don't eat, in English. Most Iraqi peasants, farmers, are illiterate in Arabic as well as English. People were very hungry. They took and made, uh, how many of you know about Syrian bread or pita bread? That they, they use that bread there. They took the grain and made that, uh, uh, and made bread out of it so they could eat and their families could eat. And 6,000 people were poisoned, uh, or 6,000 people got mercury poisoning. DMPS uh, was obtained by the American physicians who were called to Iraq to help these people. DMPS was obtained because Iraq and Russia at that time had a very good relationship. During that time, studies showed that DMPS would certainly increase the excretion 
of, of mercury in these people, over 6,000 of them who had been so poisoned. But that was an organic mercurial compound. The only time that I know of in which has appeared in a peer-reviewed journal a study of DMPS in, some, in humans intoxicated with mercury are the studies that Campbell and Coxon did in Omaha, Nebraska. Two young men were exposed to metallic mercury. They were brought into the hospital and were given DMPS. But before that, they, they, for a variety of reasons, uh, their urinary mercury was measured. We're now plotting urinary mercury versus days after treatment. What I'm trying to, what I want to point out to you by this slide is it took from day one, or day zero, if you will, almost to day 60 to bring the urine levels, if you believe this, the way this is going, down to a little bit over 10 and 10 certainly is not considered to be a desirable level. The usual level, the so-called uh, average or normal level, if you will, is about five micrograms of mercury per liter. Uh, but I want to point this out. The reason I put the slide in last night was a number of people in our study asked me, how long does it take to, to, to become detoxified using DMPS if you've been exposed to mercury? And my point is we don't know but we do have this study which points out that just one or two capsules of DMPS certainly is not going to detoxify you. And again, I want to point out one other thing that's come up over and over again, and as Dr. Michael Ziff will tell you, uh, DMPS is a drug. Uh, you as dentists, as far as I know, do not have the legal authority to administer DMPS. It's not my saying, it's how the federal government looks at it. If you have any questions about this, please see Michael Ziff. I think it's also part of your IOMT guidelines. Uh, if, if you need it, work with a physician. There are many physicians that would love to work with you, I'm certain. Absorption, distribution, excretion. Now with the remaining time, I want to very quickly go over some studies about how long these materials last, are in your body, what are your peaks, et cetera. Total DMSA in blood and total DMSA altered DMSA and unaltered DMSA in urine. These are all human studies in normal young men, graduate students. We gave DMSA at zero time, a dose of 10 milligram per kilogram, and then measured the urinary output of a variety of things and uh, over uh, 15 hours in this case. And one of the things you notice is the drug reaches the maximum in the urine in about four hours, approximately. By total drug, we mean everything that we think is connected with DMSA. By unaltered drug, we mean the parent drug that's been unchanged. By altered drug, we'll define later on, but an altered drug is essentially the difference between the experimental measurement of unaltered drug and the experimental measurement of total drug. One thing you'll notice here is we have blood total. We cannot find any free DMSA in the blood. We can't find any free DMPS either. I take that back about DMPS, actually. Most of the, over 90, over 95 percent of the DMSA in the blood is bound to protein. There is no free, unaltered DMSA in the blood. The, and here you see there's no significant difference between the total and the protein bound. And what uh, Dr. Richard Maiorino has found in our laboratory is that the DMSA is bound to plasma albumin. It's bound to plasma albumin in a disulfide linkage, in an SSS bond. So there's no free SH in the bond, uh, free DMSA that we can detect in the, in the blood or in the plasma. It's being transported through the body, through the blood, tied up to albumin. <coughs> well, if we were to take DMSA, as our chemists and our chemistry department have done, Dr. Quintus Fernando, Dr. Mar uh, Mario Rivera, if we take DMSA and in a test tube put mercury in it, we would form this kind of compound, clearly shown. In the case of lead, the chelation takes place not between sulfur and sulfur, but between sulfur and oxygen, and with cadmium is oxygen and sulfur. So we look for these compounds. We can't find them in the urine. 
either present in so, such minute amounts that we can't detect them, or the DMSA is present in some other form. And this next slide will show you the, that the DMSA is found in a, what we call a mixed disulfide. The DMSA, in blue, is bound by, by disulfide linkage to cysteine. All right? This is 95% of the DMSA found in the urine is in this form. Question comes up, is that compound itself able to chelate lead or anything else? And we use lead chelation in rats as a simple way of finding this out. And animals were loaded up with lead. At this time, they were given the chelating agent, either DMSA, the mixed disulfide, the form of which I just showed you, or cysteine and saline. And you can see the mixed disulfide does have chelating activity, or it does have mobilizing activity. Pathways then, biotransformation of DMSA as we see it, is DMSA reacts with cysteine, form a one-to-one -one mixed disulfide, which I'll tell you about in a moment. It then forms a two-to-one. This we know is able to chelate lead. What about this? Wonderful chelating prop potential here. We have SH group, we have oxygen close by, we have an amino group here. And when we look at, as Kathy uh, uh, Major did a undergraduate in our lab, she was able to show that DMSA cysteine, the one-to-one, -one, does have some, uh, ha does have very potent chelating activity, not as much as this because there is some uh, stereoisomerism involved here. Almost through, told you about altered DMSA, unaltered DMSA, how does that compare with DMPS, all right? Essentially what we're plotting here is, in humans, the percent of administered DMSA or DMPS found in the urine plotted against the time after the administration. And one thing you want to notice here is that DM DMPS will stay in the body for a longer period of time. The peak in the urine now is about 8.9 hours versus about four hours. DMPS stays longer. Animal studies have clearly shown, especially with mercury, that DMPS will bring mercury out faster than DMSA. But if you wait long enough and give DMSA long enough, the total amount of mercury coming out in either case will be the same. It's just that DMPS gets into cells. DMSA is extracellular. There are most through, if you give me a a few minutes. What about, you, you, I told you about the DM, DMSA mixed disulfide. There's very little of that formed with DMPS. In DMPS, you get primarily some dimers, some cyclic dimers or trimers, where you've got these, this is one molecule of DMS, DMPS, this is another molecule. We also, as Dr. Myerino has shown, you're able to uh, uh, get in the urine comp, uh, these uh, uh, dimers and trimers in which there's an SH there and SH there, <coughs> acyclic. Total DMPS or total DMSA in blood. Uh, these are PO, uh, DMSA given or DM, DMSA given or DMPS. Again, you see the time that it reaches, it takes to reach maximum about 3.7, 3.0 hours, but the, t the elimination time about 9.1 .1 hours versus 3.2 hours. I know it's getting late, I'll try to speed up. Preparation and doses. DMSA is just available in capsules. DMPS is available in capsules and ampules. So you can give it IV if you wish. We want to point out that in most cases there is no need to give an IV preparation unless there's an emergency, unless there's a, a acute uh, poisoning. Uh, there's a greater chance of having a reaction to a drug if you give it IV than if you give it PO. It's safer to give it PO. What kind of problem can you, uh, find, might you find if you give DMPS IV? You'll get a, a, a hypotensive effect, a very definite hypotensive effect. And clear has been reported both in the Russian literature and in, in the German literature. Uh, to give you an idea of how serious physicians take this hypotensive effect when the drug is given IV is that uh, Katie Her Dr. Katie Hurlbut was doing in our lab uh, for a master's degree, pharmacokinetics on IV administered uh, DMPS, because you can't get meaningful pharmacokinetics on a drug unless you do IV experiments. And I usually insist that I'm the first guinea pig in my laboratory, anything that's gonna be done with anyone does, is done on me first. And Katie refused to give me DMPS because she said I have an old heart 
and if my heart slowed, if we had that hypertensive effect and it stopped, my heart might not respond to the epinephrine that one should give. All right? So I'm trying to point out to you that if you, for any reason, are going to use DMPS, I can't think of any reason except a medical emergency, and then you want a physician to do it anyway, but I can't think of any way, any reason for you to use an IV preparation. It's uh, hypotensive, yeah. Uh, one other thing I want to say about preparations, uh, and I'm really sticking my neck out here for legal reasons. There are two preparations that you can buy in Europe. There is a preparation made in the Soviet Union, and there is a preparation made in Berlin. Preparation made in Berlin is called Dimaval. It is prepared with all the safeguards that the Western civilization insists be adhered to when a drug is prepared for human use. The unithiol, there's some question about this, and all I can tell you is I've received three phone calls from people over the last three years who, when they're in Helsinki, were given an IV preparation of uh, DMPS and had very extremely serious health effects. Almost, they were life-threatening. One of them now lives in Arizona, and it's actually caused, uh, opened up, well. Uh, so I want to caution you about DMPS preparations. As far as I know, Dimaval is, I, I know Dimaval is prepared in Germany under uh, conditions that we require in our Western civilization. I think I'm almost through. Indications and contra... Contra, I, I've become too relaxed with you people. Uh, indications and contraindications of QAD agents heavy metal poisoning. As you see here, that DMPS uh, for, for metals is first choice, organic metal, DMPS, DMSA, second choice, DMSA, contraindicated dimer capital bell in every case. QAD agents problems, let me, I've already talked to you about. You've got to be careful. If you're going to give it chronically, a QAD agent can decrease the excretion, can increase the excretion of essential metals, causing a deficiency of that essential metal. I've talked to you about the redistribution problem. I've talked to you about challenge and provocative tests. Uh, there's always a chance of possible idiosyncrasies, uh, reactions. Uh, question we often ask is, therapeutic agent, is the therapeutic action due to chelation? Just because you increase the excretion of the metal doesn't necessarily mean that you've increased the health of the ind individual. There's quite a bit of controversy about whether chelating agents do increase the health. And this is a long, I'll give you another hour's lecture on that, we won't. Uh, synergistic, we don't believe that more than one chelation, chelating agent should be used at the same time. All uh, chelation compounds form a metal chelate. The toxicity of the metal chelate itself is almost unknown indiscriminate, by unknown I mean as careful studies have not been done. Indiscriminate and questionable use has always been a problem. Let me just point out to you the golden ones as I call them. I'm just a loud speaker for a number of very excellent young people that have worked with me for a number of years. Dr. Richard Myerino is our analytical, analytical uh, toxicologist, one of the best in the country. Dr. Katie Hurlbut, board certified in uh, emergency medicine, board certified clinical toxicology. Dr. Richard Dott, who uh, started with us way back in 86. Dart and Hurlbut are now married. Dart is director of the Poison Control Center in Denver now. Mary Potion, the only person who could stand me for 47 years. Uh, our Mexican colleagues, Dr. Uh, Zuniga, Dr. Junco, Dr. Gonzalez, uh, James Wood, who, who has collaborated with us on the porphyrin studies, and Diana Echevera, Dr. Diane Echevera, who's who has collaborated with us on the neural behavior studies. So let me just say in summary that I've tried this time to emphasize, as far as giving you information, uh, DMSA over DMPS. I told you quite a bit about DMPS at the last meeting. I told you some about it in this meeting. Uh, these chelating agents are relatively safe, but you must remember they are drugs. The federal government com uh, uh, considers uh, DMPS at the present time to be an investigative drug. Uh, it should be used under very carefully defined conditions. Uh, it is still illegal for any pharmacist to prepare the MPS for you and give the MPS unless it has FDA approval. Uh, if there's anything we can talk about uh, while I'm, I'll be around all afternoon, uh, please, if you want uh, pardon? Yeah. Thank you.
First speaker this afternoon is Dr. Ann Summers, and uh, I think most of you have probably heard about the research that Ann has been doing uh, down at the University of Georgia, uh, and I'll let her fill you in about that. Just a little bit on her background. Um, she uh, received her BS in chemistry at the University of Illinois and her master's in microbiology at the same institution. Uh, got her PhD at Washington University in molecular biology and then received postdoctorate degrees uh, first in membrane biochemistry at the University of Virginia and uh, one in bacterial genetics at uh, Massachusetts General. Uh, she has uh, taught at uh, Harvard which I think is a little school back east is it right? And uh, she's currently a research professor of microbiology University of Georgia I think you're in for a real treat. The, the research that she has and her style of presentation is always a pleasure. It's my honor again. Dr. Ann Summers. Let's see, and we have a pointer of some kind? Laser somewhere? Great, thank you. Okay. <laughs> sure. Um, well, it's a real pleasure to be here in Tucson with uh, such a large and lively group of people who are interested in the subject of dental amalgam. I've just come from a meeting at uh, Park City, Utah, uh, which um, was on the subject of metals and oxygen in gene regulation. And uh, that meeting was almost exclusively molecular biological in its orientation. And I should say at the outset that my interest in that subject has to do with other research areas uh, that I won't talk to you about. Uh, but I have a longstanding interest in how metals turn genes on and off. And I have a suspicion that some of the things, uh, some of the things that make it difficult to see frank pathology and to ascribe it specifically to amalgam in other words, the reason it's a chronic type poison, as many metal poisonings are chronic, is that the, the, the primary effect owing to, uh, to exposure to, to metals, including mercury, is one that's on gene regulation. So that uh, given the tremendous buffering capacity that we have for metals in our cells in the form of glutathione, and I'm going to come back to this in a little while, um, we have, a, we have a, a capacity to sort of soak up metals at rather large amounts. However, there are some very specific and very sensitive targets inside of our own cells. And they may be, in fact, regulatory proteins that turn on and off important processes in our cells. And that's why this major international meeting that preceded the one that preceded this one is where I was. And I want to assure you that there is a growing enthusiasm for understanding the role of metals in regulating gene expression. So I'll be happy to answer questions about that at some point later, but I'm going to switch now to talk about the area of research that was in, engendered and begun in my laboratory, oh, 15 years ago, and then, uh, and this has to do with bacterial resistance to antibiotics. And then there was a gap in that period, and it was, there was a renaissance of interest for us about five years ago deriving from studies uh, in the laboratories of Fritz Lorscheider and Murray Vimy at Calgary. So to begin, if, um, let's see, I need the magic twanger thing here also. I guess I haven't gotten, I haven't gotten fully armed yet as a speaker. Uh, the, uh, there we go, that's fine, thanks. Okay. Now, let's start with something that's pretty familiar, and this is a slide I'm sure lots of you have seen probably reversed, actually, uh, but it's one that speaks for itself in terms of the images. Um, and, and this is the amalgam composition with 50% mercury here, and it's put in a, a human being's mouth. 
And as we've seen in earlier presentation, mercury vapor leaves that uh, amalgam filling in considerable amounts and is inhaled and crosses into the lungs. Probably a good bit of it is also swallowed. And I'll come back to how that might, might in fact, um, complement and extend the amount that comes through in the lungs. And uh, eventually finds its way to the kidneys in small amounts. But by and large, it goes out. Most mercury, uh, and this is well established of any kind of mercury, either inorganic mercury or methyl mercury at, at the outset, is eliminated in the feces. Now, I, I don't need to remind dentists that uh, there's a lot of things besides teeth and tongue uh, and gums uh, in, the, in the mouth. And those little things are bacteria of various kinds. So this is a, a part of the, uh, of the widely found normal flora that, that covers all of us, so-called normal flora, the bacteria that live all over us, starts in the mouth. The other major reservoir that even the person in the street is usually aware of is that we all carry, as adults, around a pound of bacteria in us in our intestine. And that these bacteria are benign uh, for the most part. Uh, and protect us from invasions, as do our oral floor and our mouth, protect us from invasion by pathogens. However, they are, in terms of their, their biology, they're very much like the bugs that are pathogens. Uh, pathogens have a few extra little things that our normal flora don't have, and sometimes they ga gain an advantage uh, over us under certain circumstances, and uh, we, we then come down with a disease. So we have benign bacteria largely in these re reservoirs or niches, uh, but they are genetically related to the ones that are not so benign. Oh, I'm going to, yeah. Let me, let me also say that at the outset, when mercury is evolved from the fillings, as we've heard earlier, it comes out as HG0. And I'm going to revisit a point that Murray made earlier about what it becomes. It becomes ionic mercury, HG2+. Plus. When the mercury comes out in the urine or in the feces, it is in the ionic form. And it gets to be that way by virtue of enzymes that are in our bodies. And that's a point Murray made earlier, but it's important to come back to. Uh, here's a picture you've also seen before. And this is of the uh, animals that uh, had fillings put in. And uh, as Murray pointed out, this is the deposition in this particular case of radioactive mercury. And it is ionic mercury, not HG0, as it's finally found in the bone and, and jaw and here in the intestines. And this is just to reiterate my point, particularly about the intestines. This is the mercury that you see in the intestine, the intestinal tract in this animal in a ventral and a dorsal view. And then when you remove the intestine tract, you can see the kidneys more clearly. The kidneys should be sterile, as should all of our internal organs be sterile. Uh, we are like a tube or a pipe that has microorganisms growing down through our, through our GI tract. And uh, that's where the bugs live. They live in the mouth, along with where all that mercury is. And they also live in the intestinal tract. And these concentrations of mercury in, the, in these uh, particular niches are high enough to be seen, uh, as was pointed out earlier, uh, by their uh, radioisotopic accumulation of mercury. And they amount to. Uh, as I'll point out later in this, in this particular, um, at this particular stage of the experiment, they amount to in the neighborhood of 40 to 50 micromolar mercury, uh, which is uh, well in excess of the amount of mercury that you could have in any food stuff that you might buy. So, um, and again, I'll revisit this point in more detail later on. Now, when HG0 is inhaled in, in humans or mammals, uh, it is converted and the enzyme catalase is an example, in this case, of a class of enzymes that's capable of doing this. It's converted to HG2+. As was pointed out earlier, catalase is an enzyme that has the capacity to strip electrons off of the mercury zero atom, yielding a very uh, actively combining species, HG2+, the ionic form. Both of these are, as was stated earlier, so-called inorganic forms of mercury. Now, mercury can also be presented to us in the form of methylmercury. I think it's important to have tuna fish on a regular basis. Uh, and, uh, and it has a small amount of methylmercury in it. And as you probably know, methylmercury has been identified as being neurotoxic. And, and it is quite a potent neurotoxin. Mercury vapor, on the other hand, uh, has been identified as being neurotoxic, nephrotoxic, hepatotoxic, cardiotoxic, 
and immunotoxic. And it is indeed regarded as the most highly dangerous form of mercury for exposure in the general population. And it's because of this reaction that converts it into the avidly combining form. It can react once it's been converted with low molecular weight sulfhydrals, including the very important buffering thiol called glutathione. And the abbreviation for glutathione is GSH. I'm sure many of you have heard of glutathione. Now, um, Glutathione will uh, combine with mercury in what's called a diligand, where the proton here, the hydrogen, uh, is displaced by mercury. And you'll get glutathione binding to each side of mercury through the cysteine sulfur, which is the major mercury combining group in glutathione. However, once it's on, once it's on glutathione, which is present at, at 5 millimolar, very high levels inside of our cells, it can nonetheless exchange to protein cysteines. And as Murray pointed out earlier, the cysteines are very often the, among the most important amino acids that are found in proteins. They are usually at the center of the action when they occur in a protein, or else they are often involved in structural stability in the protein. So when you see cherche le cysteine, as we say, when you see a cysteine, uh, you're looking at something that's probably very important for what the protein does in its uh, activity in the cell. And mercury can be removed and, in fact, freely exchanged inside the cell to protein cysteines. It's just that for any given protein, there's a whole lot more glutathione than there is of any given protein. However, it's a mistake to think that because there's a whole lot more glutathione that the protein will be protected forever. Mercury is very rapidly and uh, uh, exchangeable to any sulfhydryl group inside the cell. And there are some which have a greater avidity for it than glutathione does. And for those, they, in fact, will be fairly stably mercurated. Okay? So there's this equilibrium that can take place, represented by this arrow, inside the cell, which is what uh, results in inactivation of those proteins, unlucky enough to bind to mercury more avidly than glutathione does. Now, these glutathionated mercuries can be excreted from the cell. Uh, and in fact, in cells that die, of course, they're eliminated. And they circulate in the lymph and serum and, and get into various organs where they have half-lives of months to years. Uh, by and large, uh, they are eliminated from the body through the liver and in feces. There was an earlier slide of Murray's that pointed out that the amount of mercury coming out of the, of the dam, the sheep, the mother sheep, was um, two to three orders of magnitude higher. In other words, 100 to 1,000 fold more mercury was coming out in feces, and largely this is a result of processing through the liver, than was coming out in urine. Generally, in mammals, only 1% uh, to even a tenth of a percent of the mercury that we ingest is eliminated in the urine. Now, it's important to look there. That's a very easy analyte to work with. However, it's sort of like, uh, with all due respect to the people who, who care carefully measure that, it's like looking for your wallet under a lamppost. Okay, if you lost it over there around the corner behind the building under the shed, there's no point in looking for it under the lamppost because that's not where it is. It is easy to look under the lamppost, but that's not where your wallet is. And so uh, the, most <coughs> the most straightforward measure, okay, without any kind of a challenge of where the mercury is in an individual in probably, in cer certainly in acute exposure and, and also in chronic exposure is fecal mercury, all right? Nobody wants to measure fecal mercury, all right? Uh, I, I, you know how obsessive analytical chemists are. I, they don't believe feces exists, actually, I think. So that this is, this is one of these problems um, that, um, make it difficult uh, actually to get large scale sampling going because of the, it, it also, fair to say, uh, fecal material is a very difficult analyte to work with and mercury is already also a very difficult analyte. So this, this is a, a bit of biology background, but also the, the point I want to make is that what we think of as feces and what we think of as intestinal contents is actually a very complex microbial ecosystem which does, among other things, provide certain nutrients for us and help us in the digestion of our food. All right, so as a microbiologist, I think of that as an important ecosystem with metabolic capacities of its own tantamount to a whole other organ. 
okay, in terms of its digestive and transformative capabilities for food and, uh, and toxic compounds. Uh, the tremendous metabolic capacity of this stuff that we think of as feces is something that I want to bring home to you. And the other thing is, of course, as I pointed out, it's also ground zero as far as the exposure to mercury is concerned in the body. Whether you swallow it or you inhale it and it's processed through your cells, it ends up coming out predominantly through the feces. So that system is really heavily impacted. And of course, I don't need to also say the mouth, which is the other part of the, or of the normal flora that we're particularly concerned with here, is also really ground zero in terms of the immediate exposure. So it's the bugs that are really getting bashed at the front line. OK, I, I want to point out one more thing about biochemistry, and that is uh, this is from the literature on what enzymes are capable of oxidizing mercury. In other words, I had catalase on the earlier slide. Catalase is a member of a family of peroxidases. These are enzymes that are able to essentially reduce oxygen to water. And uh, bovine liver catalase is the major workhorse in, in, in terms of research in this area. And it has quite a high turnover in terms of being able to produce oxidized mercury uh, in, uh, in vitro, in a laboratory. And it does, uh, it, its activity is enhanced by added hydrogen peroxide, which is its normal substrate. Horseradish peroxidase is representative of another family, which includes an enzyme called lactoperoxidase, which I mentioned down here. In these experiments, milk lactoperoxidase was used, and its activity was uh, akin to that that's observed for bovine liver catalase. In other words, it was 127 micromoles per millimole of protein. Now, this is an enzyme that occurs in milk. It is also, lactoperoxidase is also the major enzyme in saliva. Now, saliva lactoperoxidase has not been examined yet for this mercury oxidizing activity. But the similarity of all three of these enzymes uh, suggests that enzymes of that class generally will be able to take HG0 and convert it to the combining form HG2+. We have some work in the laboratory uh, in that direction ourselves, but what I think is important, and I bring it up, is because there is this lactoperoxidase in saliva, and uh, until recently, unless he's changed his protocol, uh, at least one of the major researchers using artificial saliva to examine the release and oxidation of mercury from fillings in an in vitro setting was not employing any enzymes in the artificial saliva mix. So that the artificial saliva that one reads about or hears about in these experiments with um, dental materials doesn't include enzymes. Uh, by and large, it's just a buffer, OK? And I think what's important when you leave out the enzymes is you leave out the possibility of, trans, of, the, of this mercury zero transformation to mercury two plus. It's the enzymes in our own bodies that are the players in converting the mercury zero to mercury two plus. Okay. Okay. Now let's talk about the bacteria. And this little slide is just to represent the idea that bacteria live in many different kinds when they live. They live together in these niches, and this can represent a niche either in the mouth or the intestine or on the skin or what have you. And, and this is always composed of many different kinds of bacteria. There will be predominant ones that prefer the chemistry of a certain niche, the pH, if you will, or the uh, availability of nutrients and so forth. Within any given population of bacteria, every bacterial cell will have a chromosome, just one chromosome generally, uh, and the, that takes care of the major functions involved in growing and being a cell, just like our chromosomes do, okay? What we call the housekeeping functions. However, they will also have small additional circular DNA pieces that are called plasmids. And these plasmids carry genes in addition to the basic housekeeping functions which might be necessary in certain environments. Okay. If the bacteria were to run into the opportunity to digest an unusual carbon source other than sugar, for example, there are bacteria actually that have genes on these little plasmas that allow them to digest octane, gasoline. Okay, And these bacteria actually play an important role in the environment 
in cleaning up gasoline spills, okay? But that's an adventitious thing. They wouldn't carry that gene on, on this chromosome here. It's just for opportunities, unusual opportunities that might occur to this whole population or for unusual dangers. And coming from a clinical perspective, it's the dangers that we want to talk about right now, not octane. And it is very frequently found on these little plasmids that there are genes that confer resistance to many different antibiotics. And in the case of what we're interested in, also confer resistance to ionic mercury. And <clears throat> you may or may not be able to see down here at the bottom of the slide the reaction that the bacteria carry out to make themselves able to tolerate ionic mercury is they turn around the catalase process. They take that HG2 plus and they convert it back to HG0, which is volatile and dissipates from the medium that they're growing in. Okay? And they, they're able to do this very quickly. Now, the genes that encode this resistance property, the ability to carry out this transformation to HG0, are encoded in segments of the DNA on these little plasmids. Okay? They're chromosomes just like the other chromosome, except they're not always there. They're, they're enriched for, in other words, in a population when that population is exposed to something that's a danger. For example, an antibiotic or mercury. And these little plasmids can be exchanged back and forth to many different bacteria within the population. It's not just the one guy that has it that's going to be the only one that uses it. Unlike, unlike the chromosome that stays inside the cell all the time, each, each one of these has one of those. I mean, this is just an example. This population may not start out with everybody having one of these. But as we'll see, if you subject the population to some kind of danger, the population can rapidly get one of these genes, one of these plasmids, and it will dis uh, disseminate throughout the entire population. Replicate? Yeah. Well, it always replicates. The question was, does this replicate? Yeah, every time this cell divides, both of these things replicate. Because you have to have both, both of them in order to keep them in all the daughter cells. This is what's called clonal uh, development or clonal propagation because these cells just divide and and each time it divides each daughter cell gets both of those now in addition to that however many plasmids in particular the ones that carry multiple antibiotic resistance are capable of transferring independently okay not only can they replicate which they do every time the cell divides but they can independently go off on their own to another cell that has a chromosome of its own but doesn't have a plasmid. And that transferability is what allows for very rapid dissemination throughout a population of, throughout a niche of bacteria population. Is that a loss of the gain or just Say what? Is it lost by that organism? No, this guy keeps it, okay? He doesn't send it, he sends a copy, okay? Good points. Any other questions? Yeah. Like a fax. <laughs> like a fax. Yeah, like when you put your fax on, I think there are buttons on faxes that say, you know, clone or disseminate or something like that. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So you've got not only the division of this cell amplifying itself as often as any, every 20 minutes or so in a rich environment, but you've also got this thing sending copies to other places. Why don't they all have they will in time. The question was, why don't they all have them? Actually, when you isolate bacteria from a natural uh, environment, almost all of them have one or more physically identifiable plasmids, but they're not the same plasmid. It's as if the population as a whole has sort of a selection. When well, you take care of this gene, you take care of this gene, you take care of this gene. If we need the gene, okay, we'll exchange, okay? And they do. Anything else? Those are good yeah. questions. Yeah. How on earth do they communicate the need? Well, yeah, the question of how on earth do they communicate the need. When a given cell perceives that things aren't going well, okay, like mercury comes on, all right, gene expression changes, all right? And in fact, what we mostly spend our time studying is how this gene here, the MERR gene, how it regulates the synthesis of these detox genes. So there are, and there are additional genes in other parts of the cell 
that become aware that something bad is in the environment. Okay, and that, that actually is a fairly complex process, but just like cells in your body know when you have a beer to turn on alcohol dehydrogenase so that you can digest uh, the ethanol and it won't make you sick, okay, there are gene on-off things in these very simple organisms. And the signals involve a molecule of mercury interacting with that protein there. Just as in your body, the uh, receptor for alcohol in your cells notices alcohol, notices ethanol, and cranks up the alcohol dehydrogenase in your liver. Okay. So they, they operate like that. Yeah? Does lactobacillus acidophilus or lactobacillus bifidus or uh, strep um, decalus have, have these? Genes? Stay tuned. <laughs> Just about to tell you about that. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay, now this is how we do the experiments that I'm primarily going to tell you about this afternoon. Microbiologists work on things called petri plates, which are little auger dishes on which you can propagate microorganisms. And most often, and this circle here represents a little petri plate, most often what we will do is get from a clinic a little cotton swab. And you've probably taken little cotton swabs or little paper tips or something like that to uh, examine uh, lesions of various kinds in your own patients. And when that goes to the laboratory, the microbiologist streaks it in three directions on the plate using a loop of platinum, okay? So that the initial inoculation occurs at one point on the plate, and then it's, it's essentially diluted out by streaking in three directions on the plate. And you can see after you incubate it that really you do have, at the point of inoculation, you have very thick growth of the bacteria on the plate and then as you move into these other regions where you have streaked this material further and further in a two-dimensional way across the plate, you have fewer colonies. And this is called two-dimensional dilution. It's analogous to taking an initial test tube where you put the bacteria and then you take part of that and you put it in another test tube that has 10 mils and you take a mil of that and you put it in another test tube. And then down, when you get down here and you've done that about five times, you may only have 100 bacteria in each tube. Okay, where you started out with several million in the first one. That's a standard dilution process that's used in the clinic. In our experiments, because we have a high throughput of samples, we make use of this what's called two-dimensional dilution, where we dilute on the surface of the plate. So after incubation, we can see that we have an area where you can't count individual colonies and an area where you can count individual colonies. And this is what we call the countable area of the plate. Now, then we take that auger plate and do something that really came out of bacterial genetics. We put the plate onto something that you'd be kind of surprised what this is. This represents sterile velvet. So you get nice cotton velvet, and you cut it in little squares, and you put it over an aluminum thing, which some laboratories use like, um, or steel, use, a, use an old cylinder out of an automobile, okay? And you just put that velvet over the top of the thing, the sterile velvet, and actually, there's a clamp that holds it down that I didn't draw on here. And velvet acts like a dye stamp. You can take this Petri plate and put it down on the sterile velvet, and the bugs will stick to the sterile velvet in a pattern that exactly duplicates the pattern that's on the Petri plate. Okay? So you've made a little dye that you can stamp with. And you can stamp the bugs onto test plates, different auger plates that have different stuff in them, and every plate will receive exactly the same impression as what you call your master plate, your starting plate from your inoculum. And what's cute about that is that after you've incubated these plates then on their own, they've each been incubated now down here, you can see, okay, here's a plate that had no selection in it. It was just a plate just like this one, and here are all your colonies, okay, just the same as you had all your colonies up here. And say you had 22 is the number that we look at down here. Then you've got a mercury auger plate and an arsenic auger plate and a tetracycline auger plate. And you can see that there are different numbers in this countable region, okay, compared to the starting plate, to the parental or, or master plate. And you can take these numbers, I think this was 13 here on the mercury thing, and you divide 13 by 22 to get the percentage of the population that was resistant to mercury, was able to grow on that mercury test plate, okay? Are you transferring uh, a true likeness of the bacteria when you make that? Yep, that we're, we're transferring a colony. Okay, each one of those is a colony. Yeah, each one of those visible dots there 
is a colony, and that's the descendants of a single bacteria that hit the plate and then divided overnight into literally billions and billions of cells. And that's what a colony, and we transfer the colony to the plate. And we can see exactly each colony now. We can look, because this, because this colony right here is exactly the same pot spot on the plate, okay, on all of the test plates, we can look at that individual colony that we know made it all the way through and it grew. We can say, aha, that little rascal grows on mercury, but it doesn't grow on arsenite, and it doesn't grow on tetracycline. But if we move over a little bit, we can see a colony that does grow on mercury. It still doesn't grow on, that one doesn't grow on arsenite, but it does grow on tetracycline. So for each individual colony, we can look at what plates it grows on, and we can give it what geneticists call a phenotype. In other words, that's its characteristic resistance pattern. It's also called a resistotype. All right, so this is how we collect our individual colonies to look at and how we characterize them and how we know whether they're resistant to mercury and lots of antibiotics or not. And typically, this is done with a stack of not four plates, but 12, okay? And uh, all of these are done in replicate in multiple uh, repeated forms. Now, we can start out with plates that are initially selective for a certain kind of bacteria from a certain niche. And I'll come to that again in a moment. Okay, now where did we get interested in all this stuff? About late 1970s, uh, when I was still in Boston as a postdoc, um, I collaborated with a guy whose life's work, and it really has been a, a very successful accomplishment of his, Dr. Stuart Levy at Tufts University, interestingly the same university that at one point employed Dr. Barat. Um, in a rather different capacity. Stuart is, is a, a chaired professor in the Department of Microbiology. Stuart has taken his, wife, his life's work, the concern for antibiotic resistance dissemination in the world. And I'm sure you've seen, if you get Time Magazine or Newsweek, or maybe some of you take the journal of the AAAS called Science, over the last two years, there have been some very frightening articles about the real problem that exists, not only in the third world and not only among immunocompromised patients, the real problem of antibiotic resistance, multiple antibiotic resistance. So we were collaborating with Stuart back, back then to look, and this was late 70s, long time before now, when people are finally in the general populace getting concerned about this. Stuart and we were looking at the occurrence of antibiotic resistance in everybody, folks who are not hospitalized as well as some hospitalized folks. And his data were published in the mid-80s, and we kind of sat on our data because it was a little bit puzzling to us. But this basically is the data from our part of the study where we looked at metal resistances and correlated them with the antibiotic resistances in the same people that Stuart was finding. And what we found was if you measure the perc if you, our, our, our um, abscissa here is the percent mercury resistant flora. And basically we found in the 600 odd people that we looked at, and this is a subset of around 350 of those people, you find there's a whole range. Some people have no mercury resistance in their bacterial intestinal flora, and some have 1% of their flora that's resistant to mercury, and some have 100% of their flora that's resistant to every, everything on every plate grows on mercury, okay? However, if you then look, using the data that Stuart was, was taking, at whether they have antibiotic resistances in their flora or not, or, or two or more resistances is what we've plotted here, though we, we have them ranging from no antibiotic resistances to seven antibiotic resistances in the people. If you plot these things, in other words, the percent of the human subjects who had either no antibiotic resistances or two or more, i.e. multiple antibiotic resistances, you can see the trends. And the most ominous one really is that if you have a high amount of mercury resistance in your flora, in your bacteria, you're very likely to have also in that same bacterial population two or more antibiotic resistances. So there's a strong positive correlation with the presence of mercury resistance and multiple antibiotic resistance. And conversely, you're more likely if you have no mercury resistance to also have no antibiotic resistance. So this was a correlation, but we didn't know really at the time what possible causal reason it might have. We asked the dental community, uh, since we knew that mercury was present in amalgams and it might be a source of mercury in this niche, um, 
what, uh, whether mercury came out of amalgams. In 1978 and 79, we were sure it absolutely not. It's locked in, it's inert, doesn't come out. But we knew from environmental studies that the bacteria are only enriched, mercury resistance genes are only enriched in the population if there's some exposure to mercury. So we had a real puzzle here. Now, because of some data that I'll talk to you about shortly, there was another possibility, and that has to do with this genetic linkage on plasmids of mercury and antibiotic resistance. Okay, and we'll come back to that again, but it was possible that just in the general population, which Stewart at that time was revealing, 75% in the general population has antibiotic resistance. We didn't know why they had it, because people weren't getting antibiotics that often. Okay, but it could have been that the original selection in this population was for antibiotic resistance, and the mercury was just coming along. The mercury resistance was just coming along for the ride, because it was on the same plasmid. And if you select for a plasmid, you get everything that's on it. Okay? So that was kind of the model we had up until we started learning about the work of Vimy and Lorscheider and realized, hey, it could be the mercury. Because there's plenty of mercury out there going through the oral cavity and ending up in the GI tract, which is where these bugs were from. And that began to happen in the mid-80s and the late 80s. And in collaboration with uh, Fritz and Murray, we did an experiment in using monkeys, which we, we saw the sheep experiment. And when I read that, I kind of hoped that they were about to go to primates, because sheep, sheep flora is nothing like our, like our flora, even though their dentition and their fetal development and all this other kind of stuff uh, was a good model. Sheep are ruminants. They have three or four stomachs. And uh, even the best of us only have one. So uh, we, wanted to go to, <laughs> we wanted to go to primates. And these three lines represent each two pairs, uh, each a pair of monkeys. And so these three different experiments we did with Fritz and Murray. And this was the sampling protocol. We sampled the monkeys before installation of the fillings in that manner that I just described to you. In other words, we got these little swabs either from the gingiva or from the feces. And we put them on Petri plates and we did this business that's called replica plating that I just showed you. And so we got them up to as long as, as seven weeks before installation of amalgam. These were shorter. Um, and then the, the monkeys either had the fillings in for a month or for two months. And in the latter two pair, uh, the fillings were replaced with glass ionomer fillings. And so we got to watch, even after the fillings were removed, what happens to the microbial populations. And this little bit of data is actually chemical data on the concentration of mercury going through these animals. So this is the timeline of mercury in the feces for the initial pair of monkeys, and these were the ones that were done with the radioisotope, and then the last pair of monkeys, and these were chemically quantified. And what I want to point out is that prior to the installation of the fillings, mercury is essentially undetectable. Once the fillings go in at week zero, okay, almost immediately, these are the averages for the first week here, you see a huge spike of mercury coming through in the feces. Okay? And this is in micrograms per gram, or parts per million, as the ecologists say. And if you're biochemically oriented, this number right here is half millimolar. All right? Now, uh, when I say that to a biochemical audience, people just kind of, because uh, nobody, I mean, anybody knows in the biochemistry business, if you use even one micromolar mercury, which is uh, 5,000 times less than that, you stop cellular processes in their tracks, okay? And this intestinal contents, where our bugs live, poor little things, um, has got half millimolar mercury in it. Now, this is 100 parts per million. The EPA limit for bottled water that lots of you are drinking around here, okay, is two parts per billion, all right? So 50,000 times less is allowed in something that you can buy over the counter. But the installation of 16 small occlusal surface fillings in these monkeys, which you saw earlier, has resulted in 50,000 times more mercury being the average content of the intestines for a full week after the installation of the fillings. Actually, during this about four week period that we monitored the monkeys, they lost roughly 5% of the mercury out of their fillings. Now that, I understand, is common knowledge in dentistry, that even after the filling is set up, it continues to evolve fairly large amounts of mercury during its early lifetime. And that's where it ends up, 
coming through the feces. Now, in one pair of monkeys, well, actually two pairs, but this is the one that we present data on here, when the fillings are removed in week eight, there's another bolus of mercury that comes through the system, and it's quite prominent, actually. All right, and these fillings were taken out very carefully in the protocol that Murray described this morning, where you essentially just cross-section the thing and pop it out. And they also had high vac in there and all this other kind of stuff to protect the monkeys. And nonetheless, you have stuff that, at least in this one monkey, is in excess of half millimolar mercury for the average concentration in the week after the installation of the fillings. Well, you may not care about the monkeys. Is we, week after the that's the average. Each one of those bars is the average concentration for four samples that were taken during the week after the either the installation or the removal. So that's the average. And, and in fact, this one spiked at well over three millimolar at one point. So this goes, this goes way off scale. This goes, the average here goes up to 1.5 millimolar. Okay, so, but we care about the bacteria, okay? So what happens to the bacteria? Well, this is the estimated counts on the, on the colony master. So here we're just looking at the total counts that came on that first plate. We're getting an estimate of the total number of bacteria that we pulled out of those niches. And <clears throat> we look at two particular kinds of bacteria, the enterococci, strep fecalis, for example, that is now called enterococcus hyri. But the enterococci down here are generally more numerous in a fecal sample then are the Enterobacteriaceae, the E. coli and friends. And you can see here, however, that when the fillings go in, which is at week zero, these initial high counts drop down, on average about 80%, which means we're recovering 80% less viable enterococci when the fillings go through, right at that point where the mercury is at its highest on the preceding slide. They do recover, and they come back in fairly large numbers, Again, in week eight, the fillings gave us a spike, and you can see there's a drop off. And during the time we were able to watch the animals, it didn't recover the high numbers of the previous uh, unexposed period. This is one monkey. Uh, the Enterobacteriaceae, the gram negative bacteria, uh, don't show any clear patterns except possibly, this is not statistically significant, they may in fact increase in their numbers in this niche when these guys go down. But this is certainly evidence for a strong uh, assault on the population of the enterococci in the intestine. And the same thing can be seen in another monkey, uh, the same in that pair. Again, these are the accounts before the installation. When the fillings go in, there's that big spike of mercury, and the numbers drop off. Uh, here, 80 to 90 percent of the pre-installation level. And then gradually, by five or six weeks with the fillings in place, they come up. The fillings are removed. There was another spike and the counts go back down again. And they don't actually recover substantially. Again, we didn't watch all that long a period of time, but these are clearly not recovering their numbers to what they were in the pre-installation population. <clears throat> and again, here are the Enterobacteriaceae, uh, which is misspelling up there. Uh, these guys kind of bounce around. There's no clear pattern. They always represent a much smaller proportion, as is well known, of this niche than the Enterococci. So let's switch to the business of, uh, hey, I did get those in there backwards. Sorry about that. I'm going to have to change the timeline on this. This is where zero timeline is on this one. And so we're looking at minus seven weeks, minus six weeks out here, going over to plus 16 weeks. <coughs> and this panel up here is the mercury-resistant guys in the gram-negative, the Enterobacteriaceae population. And this is what their levels of mercury resistance are prior to the installation of fillings. The fillings go in, there's a big spike, you remember, right here. But it takes a while for the resistant population to begin to develop. And it's actually out here at week five that you achieve the maximum number of mercury-resistant bacteria in this gram-negative enterobacterial population. Then as the mercury begins to diminish, these guys don't have a selective advantage as much anymore, and their numbers go down. In week eight, the fillings are removed, and there's actually a much sharper increase and then with no fillings at all in place, the number of mercury-resistant guys goes down. So the population of bacteria are responding as if there were some toxic mercury available. The bugs know it's there, okay? The ones that have the mercury resistance genes are outgrowing the other ones. They can take over, all right? And this is the antibiotic resistance profile. This is for the last pair of animals only. This is for the entire group. 
these guys came in from the wild, as can happen with antibiotic resistance to ampicillin and tetracycline. Installation, prior to installation, however, those antibiotic resistances really washed out of the, of the animals. However, after the fillings were installed, you see a spike in um, tetracycline resistance, and then a little bit later on, actually coinciding with just after this peak of heavy mercury resistance, you see that there was a strongly an ampicillin, penicillin resistant bacterium that was part of this population. So we see a response not only for mercury resistance, but also for the presence of antibiotic resistance. Now, when we look at individual strains from those plates, those individual colonies, for example, this is our first pair of monkeys, we can see that these isolates have multiple resistances. This is mercury, tetracycline, ampicillin, chloramphenicol, and canamycin. And it occurs in, in many cases as multiple resistances. Uh, this is a, a different strain, this is a different monkey. It has two, three, not as many as four in this case, resistances to either mercury or antibiotic. That means those strains are multiply resistant. For a clinician to see that, okay, a clinician knowing that would not have any antibiotic that they could treat that person with if that bacterium caused an infection. Okay, if that bacterium got loose somewhere, for example, penetrated into the peritoneum or gave rise to or was part of an appendicitis that wasn't treated with alacrity, those, those antibiotic resistant bugs, you'd be, well, you can't do tetracycline, you can't do penicillin, the aminoglycosides don't work, all right? You'd be at a loss as to how to treat that. So if the patient was at all immunocompromised, you'd have nothing on your side. I, I should remind you, you probably realize this, it's the antibiotics don't actually kill all the bugs off. They slow them down so your immune system can get them, all right? Antibiotics work in concert with your own biology. Okay. Uh, this is the entrococci. These are the oral flora and the entrococci, and the oral strep are the ones in dark bars, and those are the ones you're most concerned with. This, this includes things like strep mutans, um, uh, strep salivarius, uh, and the dark bars, as you can see, follow the same pattern, and now I've got the rotation on here right. This is time zero for installation of fillings, and the dark bars go up for mercury resistance, and then they come back down again. And when the fillings come out, Again, we get a spike, and it, in fact, trails off at very high levels, even after the fillings have come out. Antibiotic resistance is less clear cut for the one that we were able to look at here. Uh, tetracycline is the one, and many of the entrococci and a few of the oral strep are tet resistant, but we didn't have the same kind of striking profiles for these guys for, those, for that particular antibiotic as we did for the other ones. Unfortunately, we, only, we didn't have the money at the time to do a whole suite on replica plates, but we examined individual isolates afterwards. And these are individual isolates, for example, from this, this two pair of monkeys. And we found strep and tet resistance, mercury and strep, ampicillin, chloramphenicol, strep, erythromycin, and uh, phenylmercury resistance. Very frequently finding mercury and strep resistance together. So. Uh, the mercury has selected for a population in the oral strep that are resistant to antibiotics, the same way it did with the intestinal flora. Okay, now looking over all of these monkeys, um, we wondered if, on average, the sense that we were getting that many of them that were mercury resistant were also multiply antibiotic resistant, many of these strains in other words, and, and what we show here for four of the monkeys is the number of resistances per strain, per bacterial colony, as it were, for mercury-resistant isolates and mercury-sensitive isolates. Those are the white ones. The dark bars are the mercury-resistant, and the white bars are mercury-sensitive. So for example, on average, 10 sensitive strains that we looked at had, on average, two uh, resistances, 47 mercury resistant strains had one resistance in this population. And the same over here. It looks in these pair of monkeys as if the sensitive and the resistant strains are about equal or maybe the resistant mercury resistant strains have, uh, have slightly less antibiotic resistance. However, in this pair of monkeys, these two monkeys here, the mercury resistant strains always have a much higher level of antibiotic resistance than the mercury-sensitive strains do for either monkey throughout the entire time. 
And the point I want to make about this is that the having or not having multiple antibiotic resistance that gets amplified in response to mercury can be very idiosyncratic. Like lots of things that you've heard about mercury intoxication, the normal flora, your normal flora, is very idiosyncratic. It's very much yours. And if you have a population that starts out with the potential to rapidly develop mercury and antibiotic resistance, and you get the right signal, mercury or an antibiotic, you may well develop a population that's multiply resistant much faster than the person sitting next to you. Okay. The fact that it is at all possible is clearly demonstrated here and here, indeed. Okay. So one of the reasons that I make this point is, A, for the importance of doing longitudinal studies to see whether or not these trends persist, and also to make the point that these monkeys started out with flora that were equally or slightly less likely to develop uh, antibiotic resistance. Okay. These flora d had mercury resistant strains that were more likely to have antibiotic resistance. So out of four monkeys, we have pairs that go either way. These guys would be more likely to be at risk of having an antibiotic resistant bacterial flora when they got fillings than these guys would. Okay. And that, in fact, is very likely to also occur in humans. This is the uh, Tufts collection, the one that I showed you earlier. And um, these are the numbers on our pop, uh, mercury resistant strains that we saved from the Tufts population. We did that so long ago that we only saved about 80 uh, mercury resistant uh, strain, or yeah, 80 mercury resistant strains, of which 55 um, that we've looked at. Uh, have multiple antibiotic resistances. We saved a very small number of mercury sensitive strains here. And on average, the mercury sensitive strains have slightly fewer, and this is statistically significant, resistances than the mercury resistant ones do. So the trend is still there, even though the difference is not as large as we saw with our monkey population. There are lo obviously lots of other things that impinge on um, a, a human patient population or a human subject population. But this, this generally coincides with what we saw earlier in the original sample. That is, if you have mercury resistance, you're very likely to have one or more antibiotic resistances. OK, now um, I'm coming up on telling you about why this is at a molecular level. And I want to take a little time with this and point out that um, it's now possible for, as you probably know, for molecular biologists literally to read off the DNA and see what's there, as if it were a page in a book. And we also can tell what some of the functions are when we see them. So that we know that on a plasmid, like the one I showed you earlier, there are genetic cassettes. In other words, specific chunks of genetic information that are always found together. And they operate together somehow. And it is the case that the mercury resistance genes, which are depicted right here, are very widely found as a part of a cassette that's called an integron. And it's right next to it right here. And the integron has the capacity of putting multiple antibiotic resistance genes all in a row. It's as if it's a little device for inserting resistance genes, a little molecular device. It has a little enzyme, and it picks molecular it, it picks genes from other sources, and that's one of the things we're not sure exactly where the sources are. But we find these things in nature, and all of these are cassettes that have been isolated from clinical isolates prior to the time we did our monkey work. And this one, for example, has a gene for trimethoprim resistance. This one has a gene for streptomycin resistance. This one has streptomycin and penicillin resistance. This has chloramphenicol resistance, and two different kinds of streptomycin resistance, all plugged into the same spot. OK? So it's a little receptacle, a little genetic receptacle that can have one, two, three, four, five different antibiotic resistance genes just plugged into it. And they travel together. What's drawn here is the DNA, really. OK? These things are genetically linked. If you cause an environment to be dangerous because of mercury, you're going to select for, enrich, preserve the bugs that have mercury resistance. And you're going to get the whole rest of this thing. 
okay? Just like when your chromosomes get distributed to your children, okay, if your genes for blue eyes are linked to your genes for blonde hair, it's likely that your kids will have, a, will have those two things together, blue eyes and blonde hair, all right? So it's the same kind of concept, here drawn out on a molecular scale. Now we also have the capacity to assess the occurrence of these things uh, in nature using the, the polymerase chain reaction, which probably some of you have heard about. It's a very nice uh, biochemical tool for asking in a very discreet way, how close are these things to each other? Okay, and just take DNA from any cell and use the polymerase chain reaction to see, okay, I have an integron here. How close is it physically? How many base pairs, which is the unit of mileage in genetics, how many base pairs away is it from the mercury locus? Is it capable of only holding one antibiotic resistance? Or is it capable of holding more than one antibiotic resistance? Yeah. And is there any relationship between uh, the, the mercury um, contaminated bacteria and the resistance and also the sensitivity that people show to, to antibiotics? Well, pe well, let me, the question is, is there any, any correlation between the resistance to mercury and the resistance or seven sensitivity that people show to antibiotics? And let me just clarify your language, if I may. People are not resistant to antibiotics, okay? Because antibiotics don't work on us. They don't, that's why we can use them. They don't do anything to my biology at all, okay? That's, they hit the biology, they kill the bacteria. So I, I'm sure that's what you meant, but I want to clarify this for the general audience. When a person fails, as a physician says, failed the antibiotic, I love that. So and so failed the antibiotic, all right? <laughs> Uh, it is because that person's normal flora was resistant to the antibiotic. It's the bugs. Yeah, and, and there is a correlation, okay? It's a physical linkage correlation, okay? Just as, just as my elbow is linked to my wrist, all right? The DNA encoding mercury resistance is physically linked to the DNA that's encoding. It's on the same page, if you will, okay, in the book, all right? They're, they are reading the same code. They're that close, they're closely linked. So if you grab me by my wrist, you're going to get my elbow, <laughs> all right? If I tear a page out of your book and I say I want the first 10 lines on that page, I'm gonna get the last 10 lines of information, of code. Does that help? Okay, that's what genetic linkage means. It's the information, it's a computer program, if you will, okay? You've got so many lines of code in your computer program and it tells the computer to open up and turn on and say good morning, all right? And then read you your email messages. All right, you're gonna get both of those things together when you activate that program. And that's what this is. This is a little, if you will, it's a little subroutine in the larger plasmid code. And you select for this and you're likely to get that. So we can now use the polymerase chain reaction to go in and ask physically how close is my elbow to my wrist every time in these bacteria. And that's what we're doing right now. And I, this is probably gonna be a little more molecular biology than anybody wants to hear. But the take home lesson is for these control plasmids down here, we have, for example, here's, here is a plasma that gives us a little product that is fairly small. It's only about 1,000 base pairs. And that little plasma actually only has one resistance gene in it. It has a streptomycin resistance gene. And we can look at some of these other plasmids products that are larger. And that means the fact that they're larger means there's a greater distance. And if there's a greater distance, let me go back again. Can I go back? Um, whoops, Not, don't seem to be going back again. Okay, if there's a greater distance, then there are more resistance genes stuffed in there. So the size of that little bright spot corresponds to how many, one, two, three, four, antibiotic resistance genes have been plugged into this little machine here. And, um, and, and, and this is a sampling of our, some of our monkey strains. And you can see that some of them have quite high. In fact, this, this one probably has three in it plugged in there, okay? So those are the kinds of molecular tools that we're now using to discover two things. What are the resistances that are plugged in? And this is a real important question we have to ask. Over time, as we re-isolate the same bacteria in terms of the exposure to mercury, 
does the number of antibiotic resistances that's plugged in there change? Okay? And that's what we're asking. We're using the DNA from these bacteria to look at individual bacteria. It's like looking at you and seeing, okay, how many things have you got in your pocket this week? And we find your clone next week and see how many things you've got in your pockets, you know, two or three weeks down the line. We can physically look and see at the DNA in this strain of bacteria and see how many resistances it's accumulating using this little resist. It's really a resistance accumulation machine. There isn't any other word for it. That's what it is. And it happens to be located right next to the mercury locus, right next to the mercury resistance locus. And we don't know why Mother did it that way, but she did. And, and uh, really, I mean, we're left with that. We may be able to figure out something about the evolution of this thing, but right now, we're just looking at what it's doing in real human and animal populations uh, in experimental context. So I want to finish up and thank uh, our colleagues, uh, particularly in this work. Uh, uh, Joy Wireman in my laboratory has been, uh, she's a technician, senior technician. She's been absolutely a linchpin in all of this. And she's a very wonderful, steady person who, who rolls with, oh, the samples are going to be late. Oh, no, they're on time, uh, kind of thing. And uh, Cynthia Liebert, who's a doctoral student, uh, whose primary work is the study of this uh, functioning of the integron. And two really wonderful undergraduates, Tracy Smith and Leisha Cook. And of course, our collaborators uh, in Calgary, uh, Fritz Laura Scheider and Marie Vimy. And the work has been supported, as you all will know, by you among others and we thank you very much for that and for your attention <clears throat>